you have Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. We are going to start a new series this morning going through the Gospel of Mark, which I'm very excited about. So uh, some of you who have been with us for longer may remember that we started a series on the Gospel of Mark a number of years ago. Who remembers that? Okay, not many people. That's interesting. Uh, Maybe just bad memories. (laughs) Um, Yes, we started back in the fall of 2019, looking through the Gospel of Mark, uh, which got interrupted in the spring of 2020 by COVID. Um, And so uh, we took a break for a little while. And when we got back together as churches, uh, there were a couple of other topics that the leaders at that time felt like were um, very important to, to address. And so we did a series on the church. Uh, which some of you may remember, and then after, shortly after that, did a series on warfare and looking into the idea of the, the spiritual warfare that we're in and how to engage in that. And so by the time that had happened, no one felt any kind of pressing need or uh, obligation to go back to Mark. It was an option, but not, not an option that um, we felt like we had to do. Um, but just in the, in the last month, as we've been praying together as elders and, and just kind of bringing these things before the Lord and what should we be teaching to the congregation, um, we took one particular week to read back through the Gospel of Mark together. Uh, and as we did that, we all came back together uh, with this, this sense of, yes, this is definitely the Word of God for us in this season and that God, God has a lot to speak to us through the Gospel of Mark. So that's where we'll be for uh, a while now, God willing. We will start right back at the beginning and, um, and work through the Gospel together. So we will look at chapter 1, verse 1 this morning, and this will be the intro to the book. And that verse says this, <clears throat> the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, I've taught on a number of texts over the years, but this one has to be up there as one of the best. I love this verse. It's so full of hope and new life and excitement just bursting forth. Um, <clears throat> but this verse really um, explains what the book is and why Mark wrote it. It's kind of a purpose statement for him. Uh, and what is it? It is gospel. It is a proclamation of the gospel. And so when, when Mark wrote this account of Jesus' life, it wasn't so much for the sake of history so that we'd learn and know things about the life of Jesus. It wasn't primarily a biography of his life. What it is, is a gospel proclamation. And gospel, as we know, just means good news. So this is Mark saying, I want to announce good news to you. I have good news to share with you. And so news... Mark is saying this is, this is news, that something has happened. An event has occurred that cha- has changed history and we need to know it and start to get our heads around it. That Christianity in, in the first place isn't a, a belief system or a set of principles or ideas to live by. It is uh, at its root, at its core, news. Something has happened. Events have occurred. And what we need to do is figure out our response to this and line ourselves up with those events. And so Jesus came, he healed, he delivered, he started to establish his kingdom. In the end, he died on the cross and rose again. And these are historical facts to start to orient our lives around. And they're not just of historical interest, but they're, uh, they're incredibly significant. In fact, in this short phrase, Mark is communicating that this is the most significant thing that has ever happened in human history. This is it. Out of all of the things that you know, out of all the news that you're tuning into, this is the news that you absolutely need to know. And he does that in a couple of ways. First of all, he says it's the beginning of the gospel. At first glance, this looks like somewhat of a redundant phrase, right? at The beginning of his book to say, this is the beginning. It would kind of be like if I got up here and said, guys, this morning, the first thing that I say will be the first thing that I say. It's like, yes, thank you for that insight. Uh, But what this is actually, it's a reference back to Genesis, back to Genesis 1 verse 1, which says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so what Mark is saying is this is a new beginning for the earth that is as significant as the creation of the earth itself. Like next to the fact that you exist, the next most significant thing for you is the news about Jesus Christ and you coming into right relationship with those events, with that news that has happened. 
again within this, Mark is saying that at the events of Jesus is that the answer to everything that has gone wrong in the world so far. We know from our New Testament that things start wonderfully and gloriously and then take a nosedive very quickly and very hard, right? I won't even let my kids read the book of Genesis because I'd have to answer too many questions that I don't want to answer. <clears throat> but this is what happens is human sin and quickly things descend down into chaos and pain, murder, strife, all kinds of sexual perversion, all of these things. And what Mark is saying is that there's an answer to these things. You know, when you read through the Old Testament, you get this sense that what can God actually do? Like human beings are so flawed, so prone to sin and mistakes. What could be the actual answer, the solution to these things? And, you know, that's what the prophets started to, to prophesy in the Old Testament. They started to grapple with these questions. And God started to speak to them about a Messiah who would one day come and make everything right. And so what Mark is saying is that's just not a hope anymore. That's not something that we long for, but it's here. It's happened. History has happened. Jesus has come and everything is different. This is the most important thing we need to know. And in fact, when Mark uses this phrase, the beginning of, of good news, <clears throat> he's actually kind of co-opting uh, what they would have heard at the time to be a political phrase. So when we hear gospel, we think about that um, exclusively in religious terms. And that's because that's the only context where we would ever use the word gospel. But in actual fact, how they would have heard it back then would have been as a political message. And so just to give you an example of this, in 9 BC, so nine years before Jesus was born, um, there was an announcement that went out throughout the Roman Empire that said, this is the birthday of the Emperor Octavius. And I want you to know that it is the beginning of good news. Like they use that exact same phrase, it's the beginning of good news for you. And so Mark, when he uses this phrase, it's the beginning of good news. It kind of has a subversive edge to it. It's like he's saying all of those politicians, those political systems that make all of the claims that they have, yeah, those claims are completely empty. There's no good news in there at all, but I have the good news for you, and it's Jesus Christ. And so this is what Christianity says, is that something has happened, news has occurred, and as Christians, um, the Christian life at its root is just a response to the news. That is what Christianity is, is how am I going to respond to these facts that have happened and this is important because this kind of changes our approach to our Christian life, you know, as we're seeking to grow in God and live for Him and these kind of things. Uh, our minds can go quickly to, well, we need to try harder. If we want to do better, then we need to try harder. I need to work more. I need to do better. But that's not really the message here. The message here is news has happened. You need to immerse yourself in the news. You need to get your head around the gospel and get your heart around these things because if you do, your life will automatically start to change. There's responses that will come out of you uh, that are just logical and natural in response to this news that we've heard. You know, it's just like the worship time this morning, Chris is opening, reminding us of our salvation and all of a sudden we're finding worship and praise rise up inside of ourselves. Well, it's the same for the whole of life. If we remind ourselves of the gospel of our salvation, all of these responses start to rise up out of us. And so our job is to immerse ourselves in this good news, to fill our minds with it. It's kind of like this, if I could use this analogy, if you were uh, stuck on a boat out at sea and you, you were lost uh, with no sight of land um, and you've, you've gotten to the point of exhaustion, you've given up hope of finding land, then Christianity wouldn't come to you and say, well, you need to keep persevering because it's the right thing to do. What Christianity would do is someone would come to you and say, I've spotted land. I've seen it. It's that way. Like news has happened. An event has occurred here that changes everything about your life. This is what the New Testament does over and over again. You know, the whole book of Ephesians, this is what Paul does is he just locates our lives within the story of the good news of Jesus Christ. He says, you're seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. You're now an object of his grace and mercy to demonstrate his love to the world, all of these kind of things. He's building his church, now he's gifting it. And you need to understand these things 
And then halfway through the book, there's this therefore. And everything that comes after that is just a response to what we've seen and known. Romans 6 is this same way. I love Romans 6. It's one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. I have the school of worshipers memorize it uh, every year on the school of worship. But what happens here is Paul is talking to uh, Christians who've become discouraged in their fight against sin. And is it really worth the struggle? Is it really worth the fight? Would it not just be easier to kind of give up and compromise? And what Paul doesn't say, again, is you just need to try harder and work harder. What he says is you've forgotten the good news. Let me re-preach to you the truth that you live in, which is that Jesus Christ came and died and was crucified and was risen again, and you're included in it, and it means something for your life. And he just re-preaches it to them and then says, consider these things. Like, get your head around these things and then just do whatever you would naturally do. At that point, if you're in that place in your mind, then yes, you're gonna go and make a good decision and live a good life. So this is our job, is to be people of the gospel. <clears throat> okay, and it's not just news, of course, but it is good news. There's enough encouragement in this news to support and sustain you through the most difficult trials in life, to have the perseverance that living the Christian life uh, requires. You know, the context of this book, um, it's probable that Mark wrote it in uh, the late 60s, 67, 68 AD to the church in Rome uh, that was undergoing uh, intense persecution. Uh, and of course, the church had been persecuted right from, right from the beginning and before this, but up until this point, it had been for the most part kind of localized and uh, transitory. But now you have the, the Roman emperor, the leader of the whole known earth, rounding up Christians and subjecting them to brutal torture, feeding them to the lions, burning them alive at the stake. You know, unimaginable difficulties and persecution. And what is Mark's response to this? What does he think they need? And his answer is they need the gospel. The thing they most desperately need is the good news. They need to be refreshed in it. And so I'm gonna re-preach it to them because Mark knows if they grab a hold of this story, rather if this story grabs a hold of them, then it's gonna be everything that they need to persevere through the darkest moments of their life. And so to Mark, this was the very best thing that, that he could give them. And it's important to say that this gospel, it was written to Christians. Of course, Mark hoped that it would have a kind of an evangelistic function too, and that people would get born again through it. He had Christians in his mind when he wrote it to them. And this is important because so oftentimes we underestimate the power of the gospel. We think, yeah, I get it. I've been saved. This is great. But now I need to move on to something else. So we we tend to dismiss it or move on from it. And many times it's just because our gospel is, is too small. We just don't realize the goodness of it and the implications of it. I don't see how it impacts my life. Yeah, I know it forgives my sins. I know that it secures my eternal state before God. I know that I'm rescued from hell. But what about all the rest of my life? What about broken relationships that I have? What about pain and suffering that I go through? What about sins that I'm trying to deal with? What about issues that are going on in society? And in all of these things, we tend to look to other answers many times, and it's because we don't realize the power of the gospel. It's so much more powerful than we realize. And when we turn from it, we know that the world is always ready with other gospels, other news, other things to present that they're saying, hey, here's salvation, here's fulfillment, here's life. The world always has something that it's offering to us. Many times it's just materialism. Real life is found in that new car or that new house. One more pair of jeans, maybe this one will fit me right. The world's always offering something. And it's so funny that we chase after these things when we have the good news. Like we don't need to chase anymore. Good news has come to us. I was thinking about MAGA, make America great again, or build back better. You know, what are these things? They're, they're basically a gospel. This is politicians saying, I have good news for you. 
I have hope for you. If you'll just vote for me, I can make things better. Now, you might lean towards one political persuasion uh, more than the other. I personally tend towards the one that doesn't celebrate the, the killing of unborn infants. Uh, but the point is, whichever side you land on, it's not gospel. It's not good news. It's nothing to put our hope in. Our hope is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And again, there's so many of these things. If I could just find the perfect job that would fit me and my personality and my giftings, or if I could just get the right counselor or the right therapy, then happiness and life would be on the other side of those things. And, and again, we have the gospel. We have the good news. Where is good news to be found? We have it. It's in Jesus Christ. And so whatever issues you're going through this morning, I want to tell you that good news has come to you. And it's, it's real good news. Like this isn't just a kind of glib answer of, well, God is good, so it's all going to be okay. Uh, certainly not Mark's answer. That's not Mark's gospel. What it is is a great and glorious story. We have the gospel, we have the good news, and it contains all the power and wisdom for transformation if we'll listen to it, if we'll give our ear to it, if we'll turn away from other answers and say, this is my truth, this is my answer, this is the news that I'm tuning into, this is my gospel. And so our primary job as Christians is to give our ears to this, to this good news, to take it on and own it for ourselves. In other words, the gospel, it, it doesn't just save your soul. It certainly does that, but it has the power to transform your life and ultimately change the world. You know, this, this week has been an interesting week in terms of news, hasn't it? You know, for anyone who's been following, we've been confronted with so much suffering and violence and pain, this kind of obvious expression of evil going on in the world. But here's the thing is, we're the only ones with the answer. There is no other answer than Christians proclaiming the gospel. Like this is all we've got. This is what Scott's been teaching on for the last couple of weeks, right? Like God wants to rescue the world. So he has a kingdom of priests. That's us. That's the, we're the whole plan. And we've been given a gospel. This is what we have. So we need to take it out into the world. You know, so many times we just underestimate the power of the gospel. You know that for 2,000 years, the gospel has been going out, growing and bearing fruit all over the world. Like it, it is a very, very powerful thing. You know, I like to think about the fact that we're, we're a group of people in this room. We're all here because we've submitted to Jesus Christ. We're all here because you're the Lord of my life and I want to live for you. Well, this is 2,000 years after he lived on the opposite side of the globe. <laughs> like, you get how powerful this gospel is. It is turning the world upside down. We need to know it, need to believe in it and own it. And so this is Mark's whole strategy uh, in, his, in his letter. He doesn't give a lot of instruction or, or exhortation. Instead, he just continually confronts us with the news. This is who Jesus is. This is what he did. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And so because of this, Mark uses all of his skill as a storyteller or a preacher to, to draw us into the story and to grip us with it. So a couple of things that he does here is number one, uh, he uses a, a quick pace to tell his story. This is a lightning fast gospel. And so he uses his favorite word is the word immediately. He uses it 150 times in his gospel. So that works out to an average of 10 times per chapter. And the point here is that he is always driving the story forward. He wants you to get lost and immersed in it. This is your story. Yeah, I was thinking about the, the beginning of the Gospel of Mark as compared to the other Gospels. You know, if you look at the Gospel of Matthew, uh, he starts with a long genealogy tracing Jesus all the way back to Abraham, which is, which is wonderful. But it's not particularly a quick or engaging start. <laughs> you look at the Gospel of Luke, he starts by telling the events surrounding the birth of Jesus' cousin. 
Like not even, you have to get to page two before you even hear the name Jesus Christ. Look at the Gospel of John and he starts with a long and lengthy reflection on uh, how Jesus is the Word made flesh and come and dwelt among us and it's magnificent. But again, it's not a start, a fast start to his Gospel. Well, Mark is different. You start Mark in the very next verse, John the Baptist is on the scene. Well, who's he? I don't even know, but here he is. He's baptizing. He's calling people out into the wilderness. Jesus comes, he gets baptized. The heavens open, God is speaking. Then he's driven out into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He overcomes the schemes of the evil one. Then he goes back, he starts calling disciples. He starts to proclaim the kingdom of God. He heals some people. He delivers others from a demon. And this is, page one isn't even done yet. This is the gospel of Mark. He brings us into this story. So look at what's happening. It was made to be listened to and to, it was made so that it will be hard to put down. It's meant to be this story that comes and grips us. You know, I tried this this week with Jed. I thought, um, Jed and Will, I thought, I'll just read the gospel of Mark to them uh, and see how far we get. So I'll get to the end of every chapter and just ask them if they want me to continue or if they're done. So I read chapter one, do you want me to keep going? They said, yes. So I did chapter two, do you want me to keep going? Yeah, we're in chapter three, we're in chapter four. I said, do you want me to keep going? They said, yes. So I started chapter five and then they wandered off and did their own thing. <laughs> but I thought that's pretty good, right? I did my seven-year-old and my five-year-old and the gospel of Mark is engaging them for four chapters, fantastic. Well, it's certainly not my, my storytelling, right? That's Mark. That's the way that he wrote his gospel. The next thing that Mark does is uh, he fills his gospel with vivid details. So every story that he tells, he wants his readers, his listeners to go away uh, with that story in their minds, something that, that's etched in there that they can reflect on and, and call back to mind. And so it's full of all kinds of vivid details. One of, one of my favorite is uh, Jesus uh, and the disciples on the boat and a storm comes and the disciples are in, uh, in fear for their life. And, and the implication here is that there is demonic activity behind it. Like the devil is trying to destroy their lives. And where is Jesus? He's asleep in the stern of the boat with his head on a cushion. I love that detail. It's like the enemy is trying to destroy his life and Jesus is Biggest concern is, oh, is this cushion right for me, for my head? That's how unconcerned he is about the schemes of the enemy. I love that. What a great detail. The other thing that Mark does is he fills his story uh, with cliffhangers. So he kind of uh, made the idea of the cliffhanger. It long predates 24 and Jack Bauer. This is, uh, this is Mark's gospel. And so what he does is he continually starts telling a story, brings you to the crucial moment and then interrupts it with something else. And you're like, well, no, what are you doing, Mark? I gotta hear the end of this story. So the most famous example of this is when Jairus comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, would you heal my daughter? She's, she's sick in bed. She's this close to death. And Jesus says, yeah, I'll come and heal her. But as he's walking through, uh, someone in the crowd touches the hem of his garment. And in that moment, he's so concerned with who touched me. I want to have an interaction with this person and bless them, which is wonderful. But as readers, we're like, oh, Jesus, remember this girl? She's like this close to death. Does, does this conversation really matter so much? Is this cliffhanger moment. And of course, we know the story, which is that um, in the end, this, this little girl dies, uh, but Jesus still goes to her and is able to raise her from the dead. It's magnificent but what drama, what an amazing story. You know, the other way that, that Mark does this is just with uh, abrupt endings to his story. He doesn't very often tie up his story in a way that's kind of um, satisfying, but, but he leaves us with more questions than answers. So going back to him cal calming the, the storm, you know, the end of that story isn't the disciples happy and praising God and, oh, it's so great, we got rescued. It says they were full of fear and they say, who is this then? that even the wind and the sea obey him. And then they come to no conclusion about it. <laughs> it's a very dissatisfying end to the story. And in fact, the whole gospel ends with the most uh, abrupt ending that you could ever imagine. Okay, so Jesus dies, is placed in the tomb, and then he, he raises from the dead. 
and the women go to visit the tomb and they find it empty and they find an angel there who says, he's not here, he's risen. And then this is how the gospel ends. It says, and they went out from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And that's the end of the gospel. <laughs> You're like, what are you doing, Mark? This is the worst possible ending. And in fact, this is kind of like the original prequel sequel. Like a lot of people think that Mark intended to write a second part, um, but this is his ending. This is what he does. And so he's not so concerned with wrapping up the story neatly for us, but presenting it in such a way that it hits us. It engages us and brings us into it. It confronts us again with news. What are you going to do about this news? And so what is the news? What is the good news? What is the gospel? Well, again, in our first verse, Mark summarizes it as the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so it's a proclamation of two things. Number one, that Jesus is the Christ. That's not his last name. That's a title for him. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the anointed Savior, Jesus the one that human history has been waiting for to come and deliver them. And the second thing is that Jesus is the Son of God. And so these two proclamations kind of divide up the gospel of Mark into two halves. The first establishes this point that Jesus is the Messiah. And so in the first half, he does uh, generally what uh, everyone was expecting the Messiah to do. He comes on the scene with authority, authority over sickness, he heals them, authority over demons, he'll cast them out, authority over the forces of nature. I'm just gonna walk on water. Why? Just because, because I have all authority. Authority over death itself. Like when you think, okay, that was the end of, the, of that girl's life. No, Jesus has the authority to reverse even death. So this is who he is. He's the Messiah. He starts building a grassroots community. He's continually conflicting with the authorities of the day, chapter two. This is all over the gospel, but chapter two is a great example of it with just five conflict stories. Like Jesus is doing his Messiah ship stuff. <laughs> He's messiahing. <laughs> and all of the, uh, the authorities of the day were saying, you can't do this or you're getting this wrong or this breaks with our traditions or our principles and laws. And so why are you, uh, why are you doing these things? In, the, in chapter two, again, there's four questions. Why this? Why don't your disciples fast? Why are you saying that you can forgive sins? all of these kinds of things. And Jesus comes out well from all of these conflicts. He has an answer to all of the questions. He silences his opponents and he shows no interest in conforming to the status quo. No, he's saying, I'm the Messiah and now everything is different. Yeah. And so the first half establishes that Jesus is the Messiah. But the second half establishes that he's the son of God. And so there's this turning point in chapter eight. Uh, let's read it together. Chapter eight, starting in verse 27. It says, And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them not to tell anyone about him. Now, if you've been reading uh, the gospel of Mark up until this point, it's not particularly a groundbreaking statement for Mark. It's like, how could you, or for Peter, you know, how could you come to any other conclusion based on seeing all of the things that Jesus has accomplished? And yet it's the first time in the gospel that a human being has recognized you are the Messiah. But immediately after that, that this leads to a, a turning point in the gospel. You know, the disciples have come to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, but their, their understanding of what that is, is, uh, is severely deficient. There's no room in their understanding of who the Messiah should be for one who would suffer, 
one who would sacrifice, one who ultimately would give his life away to a sacrificial death, which of course is the very heart of what Jesus came to do. And so reading on in verse 31, it says, and he began to teach them that the son of God must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Now, this isn't Jesus just being randomly harsh, like you got it wrong, so I'm gonna call you Satan. I was thinking, should I use that strategy on the school of worship more? (laughs) Get a little more respect. No, this is Jesus in his grace and his love saying there's something so wrong in your thinking. It's more like a satanic thought than a God thought. If your Christianity has no room for suffering and for sacrifice, then you're not really following Jesus because that is who he is. That's what he is all about. That was his entire mission. And so Jesus begins to reshape their understanding of what his messiahship is, what his kingdom is, and he reshapes it around the idea of the cross. That the display of his authority isn't just to the darkness out there, like I can defeat all your enemies, but Jesus realizes that the darkness is inside every one of us. It's like right down in the depths of our soul. And so the answer to that wasn't just gonna be a display of power, but it was the only answer was, I'm gonna have to sacrifice and give my life away. I'm gonna have to take the punishment that sinful human beings deserve. I'll take it on myself in order to win salvation for them. Now that's good news, isn't it? So just a geographical note here, you know, when, when Peter proclaims that Jesus is the Christ, They're up in Caesarea Philippi, and that's the northernmost point of the gospel. And from then on, every geographical location is just a step further down and further down. And it's like from that moment on, Jesus has just set his face on Jerusalem. Now I'm gonna do what I came to do. No one's gonna stop me from giving my life away in sacrifice. And so he says it again and again, I'm gonna suffer and die. I'm gonna lay down my life Finally, he was betrayed and deserted by everyone. He was rejected. He was given over to death. And as he hung on the cross, the centurion said, surely this man is the son of God. Like all of his power, all the display of his power that proved his messiahship, but it was when he was giving his life away that he showed most fully and demonstrated the nature of God himself. What an awesome God we have to give his life away to win salvation for us. But interestingly, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't ever present his sacrifice, his cross destination as something that's unique to him, which is how we would tend to think about it. But right from the beginning, he includes his disciples into it. It's kind of like, I'm going to die you'll need to die too. And so jumping back to chapter eight, after he predicts his suffering and death, it says in calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said this. Now let's just take a moment here because this is something that many of us will be quite familiar with, but I'd love you to hear it with fresh ears as not just a saying that you know, but this is Jesus Christ, his word to you. He said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? And so we know that the cross was um, unique 
In that sense, it was something that Jesus did that no one else did or could accomplish. And yet Mark seems determined to pull us into this story of Jesus. He doesn't want us to understand the cross as a, a great thing out there that Jesus did for us only, but he wants it to become imprinted on our hearts. This is the way I'm to live. If I'm a follower of Christ, then I follow Christ. I lay down my life. All of a sudden, it starts to sound less like good news though, doesn't it? <laughs> like, Mark, I thought you were giving me announcing good news here. This is starting to sound a little bit like bad news. And it's certainly nothing like the good news that the world has to offer, is it? Everything that the world would say is you can have fulfillment, you can have your dreams come true, do what feels best to you, do what's right for you. Jesus says something a little different. He says, I want you to give your life away. I want you to pursue a life of sacrifice and humility and service because he knows that we can chase after all these things and we can even gain the whole world, but lose our whole soul. Like Jesus knows this. You can have the perfect car. You can have the perfect house. You can have the perfect family and you can have nothing at all. You can get to the end of your life and realize I was chasing nothing. And Jesus calls us away from that and says, no, if you live like me, if you lay your life down in sacrifice and humility, that's where life really is. And Jesus isn't condemning us to a life of misery here. He's opened up the way for us to live in his kingdom, to live like him and to image him out in the world. And he knows that's where life is. That's where real life is. And of course, that's not the end of the story because on the other side of the cross is resurrection. On the other side of losing our life is finding it. And so this is incredibly good news. Jesus is saying, I will save you from a life of emptiness and selfishness and entertainment, just living for yourself. And I'll save you into a life of mission. And hey, let's change the world together. Wonderful salvation. So I just want to end here with what, what do we do? How do we go out from here? I have, I have two, two questions for us to reflect on this week. And the first one is this. Have I started to put my hope and faith in any good news other than the true gospel? Is there anything that if I'm honest with myself, I've been pinning my hopes on? People are taking pictures, remember? Don't need to do that. <laughs> you know, God started to speak to me a bit about this over the summer. He started to speak to me about my house. And I have a wonderful house. It's a great place to raise my kids. Uh, and it's quite easy for me to be uh, satisfied and content with that house. But what God showed me was that part of my contentment was in this idea and this dream of an upgrade later on. Like I'm fine with this house for now because one day I can get something better, I'm sure, if I'm financially wise enough. And it'd be really great to have an ensuite bathroom eventually. Sounds wonderful. But God started to talk to me and say, is that, is that where your contentment is? Is that your good news? Is that your gospel? Is an ensuite bathroom one day? Like how empty and so there's these kind of heart checks that we can do on ourselves that are really good, which is where is my hope? Where am I putting my hope? Am I putting it in Jesus Christ? Is my life all about his gospel? Or is it this nice little side gospel that I'm creating for myself? Second question is this, what can I do this week to center my mind and heart back on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because the thing is, is this in a, in a room like this, the things that I've said this morning probably aren't new information to most of you. Probably not teaching you something that you don't already know. But the question is, how do we make this at the forefront of our mind? How do we consume our lives with this so that we begin to live from it? And so I want to challenge us to think of ways to center ourselves back on the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
you know, a great way to do it this week would be to read through the whole gospel of Mark. It takes about 1.5 hours. Took me two. Um, but that, that, that's a great thing to do, become immersed in this story again. You know, I'd recommend taking one day and reading through chapters one through eight and see how Jesus is the Messiah, see how he has authority over everything. And then the next day, read nine through 16 and see how he was so willing to give his life up to death for our salvation. But this is who we are. This is all we've got. We've got the gospel. Let's center ourselves back on it and live from it. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, God. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news. Thank you that news has come to us. Thank you that there's so much encouragement and life in what you've done. Jesus Christ. God, help us to live from this place. Help us to take the encouragement and the life that is on offer to us and help us to be bold with the gospel, I pray. God, will we not be ashamed of it? Will we not be tricked into thinking that it's irrelevant or impotent, but may we share it with our kids, with our family, with our neighbors, with our coworkers. God, may we be people of the gospel. And Jesus Christ, we say that we love you. Thank you for writing this gospel with your life. We worship you, we honor you, we adore you, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Great job, guys.